30 years ago today, a botched safety test led to the world's worst nuclear disaster. The unintended consequences of the explosion and meltdown of reactor number four at Chernobyl in eastern Ukraine include untold deaths from thyroid cancer, the permanent evacuation of a city of 50,000, and the loss of faith in authorities that contributed to the fall of the Soviet Union. Here in France, the credibility of official statements was also put to test at the time. We still remember a weather presenter's assurance that a high-pressure system was keeping the radiation cloud away from the French border. France, with its 58 nuclear reactors, particularly sensitive to this story, its reactors that are aging. On Monday, the president reiterated his promise to close the oldest one at Fessenheim, near the German border. No firm date is set. So what future, then, for atomic energy? What lessons from uh, 30 years ago? And could the next Chernobyl be on purpose? It's a serious question since Belgian authorities revealed that the Brussels attackers considered targeting nuclear plants there. Today in the France Venquet debate, we're looking at the fallout from Chernobyl. With us, reporter and filmmaker Tanya Rachmanova. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. We want to welcome as well Cyril Cornier. He's campaign director on energy matters for Greenpeace. Mm -hmm. Nice to see you. And we welcome back Bruno Combi, who heads Environmentalists for Nuclear Energy. Nice to see you. Thank you. The uh, France Fight Get Debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, our hashtag F24Debate. As they've been placing this new steel dome over Chernobyl, they took time this Tuesday to remember. Josh Vardy has more. A disaster that became a byword for the dangers posed by the mishandling of nuclear energy and which turned swathes of Eastern Europe into a no-go zone for humans. At commemorations marking 30 years since the Chernobyl disaster, Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko also highlighted the political fallout. Chernobyl first of all became a catalyst to the collapse of the Soviet Union contributing to the emergence of opposition, anti-empire forces, and bringing us closer to independence. Earlier in the streets of Slavutich, 30 tolls of the bell at 1.23 a.m. marked the moment when the world's worst nuclear disaster hit the plant, about 50 kilometers outside the town. On April the 26th, 1986, a faulty reactor at the Chernobyl site exploded and went into meltdown during a botched safety check. Radioactive waste pumped out into the surrounding environment for 10 days, and a 30-kilometer protection zone was implemented, which still exists today. Around 116,000 people were forced to evacuate, and a further 230,000 left their homes in the following years. At the time, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union, and authorities initially tried to hide the accident. The public were only alerted two days later by Sweden. The death toll is still unknown. Only 56 victims have been officially recognized. The UN believes up to 4,000 people could have died in 1986 or the following years in Ukraine, Belarus and Russia. At the site of Chernobyl, engineers are currently building an arch over the damaged reactor. They're hoping a leak-tight barrier will bury the radioactive waste for at least the next century. Tanya Rachmanova, 30 years ago today, you remember um, where you were? Oh, yes, of course. I mean, the day, the day of the explosion, nobody knew anything, so it came, the information came much later. But, yeah, it was quite a shock. I, I was at university and uh, we didn't know anything about it. And first, of course, we didn't take it seriously. What was important, I think, the most, because the information about the nuclear radiation, the importance, we we knew only Hiroshima, you know, as the, but this, the lack of information um, on behalf of the authorities. This is your um, story, they were right, that it was the beginning of questioning the lack of information. But there were hundreds of gossips, stories, uh, and uh, no as information what? at all. Well, of course, uh, you know, the first thing which was very important for us, and it was absolutely serious that we were told that if we drink enough of alcohol, we can s clean our bodies from radiation. So the amount of alcohol which was drunk during this period, but like from the mid-May, because the information came late, in fact, I mean, I was in Moscow, not in So Kiev. alcohol instead of iodine. Yes, 
uh, yeah, because I died first, we didn't have, then we didn't believe in it. And alcohol was kind of idea that I think a glass per 10 or 9 kilos of the weight. Uh, sort of like a w once a week. So if you calculate, it's quite a lot. I mean, of course, it sounds now funny. I mean, it was partly, but the, the people were completely lost because they didn't know what to do, how to react, where to go. And the, well, of course, the were trying to avoid Kiev, but Kiev is an enormous uh, city. It's the capital of Ukraine, so there were all these people living there. By the way, there was this first May demonstration where the authorities uh, insisted that to maintain the demonstration, so the people came out in the streets, but they le they sent their families to Moscow. That's what we learned kind of a couple of weeks later. That was quite a story. And it still goes on. You're right, they, there is no enough information. Now, this is a period of, of history where um, the process of glasnost and perestroika were already uh, underway. Uh, Coming, because uh, Corby, Gorbachev took power in March mm -hmm. of the same, uh, no, in March 85. So, yes, yeah, it was, but it was still, we didn't realize it yet. People, when still. they see, you know, when they talk about events that contributed yeah. to the collapse of the yeah. Soviet Union, they talk about Afghanistan. But how important is Chernobyl in all of that? I think that at that time, Chernobyl showed to us the um, the problems of the Russian economy, most of all, the problems in uh, uh, dealing with the in the, this crisis situation. It was clear that. Uh, the government, it's not the government, that the economy they can't cope, that we can't stop it with, there is no information, there are no enough facilities, uh, there was no, uh, we didn't know what to do. So it was, yes, it, it was kind of, uh, maybe it it contributed, it's probably it was not the main reason of the collapse of the Soviet Union, but it was, uh, it was quite shocking because we grew up with these awful stories about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You know, for us, that was the nuclear problem. And once of a sudden, something happens in our country. And I can tell you that we still have this expression, you know, because in August and September in Moscow, near Moscow, we have, you know, this famous Russian saying of uh, going, picking up mushrooms. And that year, mushrooms were so big. So even now, if you find a big mushroom, you can call, you call it mushroom of Chernobyl. Call it a Chernobyl, a uh -huh. Chernobyl mushroom. Yeah. Uh, one final question on the on this period of history, yeah. because we saw our correspondent Gulliver Cragg was reporting earlier, the speeches on for this 30th commemoration uh, were quite martial on the part of Petro Poroshenko. Of course, the contamination area extends into Belarus; it extends into Russia itself. Um, there isn't this feeling of unity, it seems today. No, though I agree, like I was, you know, because Belarus was touched maybe even more than uh, Ukraine in terms of the contamination. I mean, now Ukraine has to deal with the problem, but we don't see much of, you know, we didn't see much of representatives of, uh, well, we don't say, well, the Russians won't come today, the officials won't come today to Kiev, uh, but uh, Belarusians, I don't know, I don't know why. But. Bruno Combi. Uh, your thoughts of 30 years ago and, and what impact it's had on you and the work that you do. Mm. Yes, well, uh, of course, 30 years after it's the <coughs> anniversary today. And uh, I think Chernobyl reminds us of how important nuclear safety really is. Um, of course, at Chernobyl, there was no containment around the reactor. The test that was done on that day was a forbidden test. You were not allowed to conduct the reactor in that manner. And they still did that just to see what happens when you do it. So that's exactly the perfect example of what Who you should not order? do. Who gave that order? Well, it was coming from above, you know. And, the, and the, some of the engineers said they shouldn't do it because it was forbidden. And they were given sort of political orders to still do it. So when you drive a car above the speed limits with no safety belts on, and the car has not been maintained, and in fact it was never constructed in a proper manner, then you get a bad accident. So that's what happened with Chernobyl. It's the worst accident you can get, in fact, with a nuclear plant. More than half of the radioactive content of the core went straight out into the atmosphere. So it's a, it's a terrible accident, the worst you can get. But if the reactors are properly constructed and properly maintained, none of that happens. In Fukushima, it's a rather different story. 
Uh, in Fukushima, there was a containment, but it was very thin, only 10 centimeter thick. The containments we have in France are one meter of thick reinforced concrete. And in the case of the new EPR reactor, it's a double containment, twice one meter thick. So the worst accident we could have in France would be what happened in 1979 in Three Mile Island in the United States, which means that the control of the reactor was lost. The engineers in the control room pressed all the wrong buttons because they had a bad appreciation. They had a wrong image of what was going on. So they pressed, they thought they were doing the right thing, but in fact, they made it worse and, and the reactor melted. So this could happen also in France, hopefully not. but. It could happen. But what happens is that because there's the thick containment around the reactor, then the radiation stays contained and does not go out. So in Three Mile Island, no one was injured, no one was killed by the radiation. Uh, the, the, um, before we talk about the specific case of France, are there other nuclear power plants out there around the world that uh, are as faulty as those that existed at the time there? Well, yes, there are. In fact, there are still the RBMK reactors, uh, similar to the Chernobyl mm -hmm. reactors. Some of them have been closed, especially the four Chernobyl reactors, but also a few others. But there is still a, a small dozen of them which are still in operation today in other countries. So my belief is that these should be... Which other countries? Well, Eastern countries. Eastern uh, Europe. For, for former Soviet Union. Um, so these reactors are unsafe, but when you compare with the alternative sources of energy like coal, gas, or oil, in a coal plant, people die just to produce the coal every day, every year, in the coal mines by thousands. So in the coal industry, people <coughs> die all the time, even when there's no s specific accident. So it's dangerous all the time, all year long, by thousands of people. So uh, my belief is that a nuclear power plant, especially if it's properly constructed, is always safer and kills fewer people than uh, um, a nuclear reactor, which is safe 99.99% of the time. And if you do everything wrong, it can go bad and, and you can have an accident at like Chernobyl or Fukushima. Uh, hopefully, if it's well constructed, it just cannot happen or it doesn't have the same consequences. So, Cyril Cormier, you, you agree? Well, it's always very difficult to track the, the numbers of, uh, of deaths uh, after an accident. And the example of Chernobyl is definitely uh, a sad example regarding that because no uh, safety uh, um, health procedure has been put in places by uh, the states. The, of course, the Soviet state at that time, but also in France, we have to remember that no tracks, no system to track uh, the impact on the uh, environment and on the health had been set up uh, just after the accident. So it's very difficult today to uh, exactly understand what were the impact on the health and on the environment uh, after this accident in uh, in Chernobyl. But of course, it's it's so it's easy to to make the comparison with the uh, with the the coal factory or other factory. What what is really impacting when you see those images and when you see the impacts of a nuclear accident is that 30 years later you're still dealing in a very very large region around uh, Chernobyl with five million people living in a place where they should be evacuated, and well, that's we still have untrue. we sti we still have to organize the way to deal with the nuclear reactor to build a confinement, which is very late. It was supposed to be delivered so wait, how, 12 how? years ago. It's very, very difficult right. to build this confinement. The first one has been a failure itself. And we will require a lot of time to uh, uh, de deconstruct this, uh, this building, to deal with the waste that it creates, and to uh, put it back to a normal yeah, The confinement uh, dome that uh, we saw in that report there. Uh, you're, you're saying that uh, the um, radius around which uh, there shouldn't be human beings living should be much broader? H how big should it be around Chernobyl? Well, we know that the impact were uh, as 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 up to five, uh, 300 kilometers. Doesn't mean like all the areas uh, in a 300 kilometers radius were impacted, but we know that it went as far as 300 kilometers. In Fukushima, it was 100 kilometers. So definitely the area around uh, a reactor that should be evacuated is about uh, one to several hundreds of kilometers. T Tanya Rachmanova? Well, tell us a bit what, how big an area that would be, how many people that would, that would well, be. Well, that's, this is the, the big 
problem and big question that the information is not there. We don't, we don't really, nobody did, I mean, at least the officials in, in Russia, well, in the Soviet Union, and in Japan neither, they didn't do a proper research, the proper test and proper uh, information to the people. And what I think that if there are some nuclear stations, they are 99% safe, probably there are, but the others, and we are all interconnected. Uh, Chernobyl shows very well that it was in Ukraine, but only the whole Europe been concerned. So I think that the most, the, 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 for me, the very important problem is the lack of information and lack of the access to these nuclear stations. Me doing a film on Arctic, I discovered that there is a nuclear uh, power station in Arctic, in permafrost, in the region where the change of the, uh, uh, the climate is the most important. And no one has access to the station, no researcher. I did a lot of research on it. What is happening there, nobody knows. And there was an accident in the 90s. Only the Russians are not concerned because it's close to the United States. It's uh, right uh, in Chukotka. So, and the wind goes to the United States. So if there is a problem, it's the American problem, not Russian. All right, we're going to pick up on that point. So when we come back, and, uh -huh. we're going to take a very quick break. Stay with us. You're watching the False Fun Cat Debate.